Previously on Lost Gold of World War II. Keep going until you can. I've run into bedrock. I can't dig any deeper. I want to see the target. What about a horizontal drill? It's the best bet we've got right now. You guys might want to come look at this. Looks like charcoal. We need to take another look at these tapes we've got from Bob Curtis. The maps show about 10 feet below the surface and was a layer of charcoal. Charcoal at 10 feet. We got charcoal at 10 feet. We did write about a fellow by the name of Chuck McDougall. He's probably the only living expert right now. If you can find him, I'm sure he can help you. Casey and Rick Hurt are back in the Philippines with a new team continuing their search for Yamashita's gold. We're going to find a way to get to this treasure. Like many others, John believes Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita took billions of dollars in treasure looted by Japan during World War II and buried it in the Philippines, including somewhere in this mountain. Following a series of mysterious symbols they believe were left by Yamashita, the team is investigating three sites. A waterfall. This waterfall is hiding something. A crater known as Breach 6. I've never seen anything like this. And a camouflage tunnel they uncovered last year. We are in the mount, boys. Can they finally discover the lost gold of World War II? As a new day dawns on the mountain, the team adds another machine they hope will finally get them into the waterfall, a horizontal drill. This horizontal drill may be our best bet to send the camera all the way down there and see inside this mountain. They are determined to reach metal deposits that could be treasure in a void space beneath the waterfall. We think we've got either a tunnel or some type of void space. And it's quite deep. Wow. It's like about 300 feet down. Whoa. After a frustrating setback. I've run into bedrock. I can't dig any deeper. The plan is to drill 930 feet horizontally through the mountain at an altitude of 300 feet below the waterfall so they can feed in a borehole camera. But drill operator Andrew is having a tough time getting the machine to the new site. We've had some rain today. The access track to the drill site at the moment's uh, atrocious, to be honest. It should be OK, but well, it's, it's still it's a risk. It's a chance we still get stuck. Andrew is navigating this four-ton rig up three miles of muddy, steep terrain. The road is absolutely crap. Every day, we're losing time and money. It's a long shot, but we're going to take it. It's the only shot we got. Over at the tunnel site, miners Levi and Geo venture further into this underground mystery. Watch yourself. The tunnels already revealed evidence of both American this was, without a doubt, an American knife. And Japanese presence. It's a Japanese A3 landmine. Though they're anxious to explore what lies ahead, they're moving cautiously. We've used metal detectors and we've used dogs. We're putting everything in our corner that we can to make this as safe as possible. But the Imperial Army was smart. There's different techniques they use to booby trap these mines, so we have to be careful when we go in there. We got a major, major cave in. Hey, Levi, you gotta come check this out. Look at this mouse. Wow. It looks like the whole world come in. You get so many different things that can cause a collapse like this. Somebody could have tried to blast it shut. 
There could have been a booby trap that was set off. It could have just been erosion, the earth gave out. There could be multiple different reasons. When you come to the collapse like this, there's times to go through these things and there's times to go around them. The big thing is, is we're not gonna know until I can climb up on top of this and try to poke a hole in there and see over the top of it and see how long it goes. That's a mess. In the US, head researcher Bingo Minerva is chasing down a promising lead. I'm in San Francisco today, on my way to meet Chuck McDougall. Now, this is huge for us because we have not found any other person that is still alive today that knows Robert Curtis. He might even have some maps that, that are related to our mountain. While meeting with Las Vegas Sun editor-in-chief Brian Greenspun, Bingo asked about other American treasure hunters connected to Robert Curtis. The newspaper chronicled a 1988 treasure expedition led by Robert Curtis in the Philippines. Chuck McDougald was with him. I mean, Chuck could really be the missing link that helps us find the gold. Good morning. Morning, sir. You must be Bingo. Chuck, pleasure to finally meet you. Same here. Please come in. Thank you, sir. So, Chuck, really excited to be able to just pick your brain. And really, I just was wondering, how did you even get your start in the Philippines? What brought you there? I moved there from Hong Kong in 1972. I wound up staying there 10 years and going to school and getting my PhD at the University of the Philippines. While I was working on my doctoral dissertation, it was about corruption in the Philippines. This was during the Marcos era. Ferdinand Marcos ruled the Philippines from 1965 to 1986. He allegedly killed a 1,000 of his own citizens and stole over five billion from the national treasury. But Marcos's reign of brutality reached a tipping point with the assassination of political rival Benino Aquino in 1983. Senator Aquino was assassinated on the tarmac at Manila Airport. And we all knew what that meant, that Marcos did it. Although it was never proven, many believe that Marcos gave the order for the assassination. I started keeping a file on Marcos about the corruption. McDougall shared his file with one of his professors, Dr. Emmanuel Soriano. Dr. Soriano was chancellor at the University of the Philippines and he was part of a group that helped overthrow Marcos. And they encouraged me to, to write the Marcos file showing what he had done to the country. After he was ousted from power, Marcos was replaced by Benino's wife, Corazon Aquino. While McDougal was documenting evidence of Marcos's corruption, he came across the name of someone hired by the former leader to locate the Golden Lily treasure. Robert Curtis. And the next thing I know, I'm calling Curtis and going to Las Vegas to talk to him. Wow. Uh, talked to him for two days, and Curtis said, all I want is to go back to the Philippines and resume looking for the treasure. Curtis kept claiming he had the maps. That sounded like it might be real, might be interesting, so for for that reason alone, I said, let's just take a look at it. With Curtis's knowledge and McDougal's connections, the two struck a deal to find the lost fortune. I flew back to the Philippines and saw Dr. Soriano, who had been appointed National Security Director. And I said, I think I've got some information for you here you might be interested in. He called the president, Aquino, and said, ma'am, we need to give Curtis the permit to hunt for the treasure. And they did. And we began searching for gold on Fort Santiago on February 8th, 1988. For over four centuries, Fort Santiago in the Philippines was a stronghold for Spanish, British, and American armies. The Japanese seized it in 1941 and possibly used it as a treasure site. According to Curtis's research, 
The labyrinth of tunnels and dungeons running under Fort Santiago holds portions of General Yamashita's fortune. We have photographs of maps. We have engineering drawings, other photographic evidence to determine uh, the location, the exact location. Was there any point where you actually found any treasure? Yeah. During the uh, dig at Fort Santiago, at the 40-meter level, we encountered marble and gold flecks on our drill, on our drill bit. Flecks of gold and marble. It was already in the maps that they built the marble fortifications before bringing in the treasure. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, that in itself is, is huge. Not only are you getting marble and gold in the same spot, I mean, what more evidence do you need? Yep. Why'd you stop there? Because the president said that uh, we had to leave the fort. All of a sudden, the head of the construction company comes to me and says, Charlie, we've been ordered to shut down. In San Francisco, Chuck McDougall recalls the abrupt end of his treasure hunt in the Philippines. All of a sudden, the head of the construction company comes to me and says, Charlie, we've been ordered to shut down because the president said that uh, we had to leave the fort. That came out of the blue, shocked everybody. But we couldn't do anything but pack up and leave. Um. <clears throat> Do you have any theories as to why Aquino would, again, seemingly out of nowhere, just stop you in your tracks from digging at Fort Santiago? Well, at the time, she was under enormous political pressure. We surmised that there were senators more powerful than we ever would be that went to President Aquino and said, these people have to go. And after we were gone, they would go back in there and recover the treasure for themselves. I mean, if it's really the senators having enough power to shut the president down to stop you from your excavation, uh, I mean, really, how far does it go? The closer you get to the treasure, the more careful you have to be. There are people that are going to secretly observe everything you do. And if and when they think you've found a treasure, they, they might step in and uh, either steal it from you or just kill you right then and there. I mean, that's a very good indication that you're on the right path then. Yeah. Is there a possibility that you have any actual maps during the time you were searching for treasure in the Philippines? During the dig, Dr. Soriano was called to the palace and returned with a file holding about 30 or 40 original maps of the treasure found in Marcos's office. I had two originals that I retained, and I photocopied 24 more. I'd love to look at the maps. There's never been any tangible evidence of, of any kind of maps that were real. And the fact that you've gotten these from Marcos's office, I mean, in this whole story, he's the only one that, that I'm aware of, at least, that has actually cashed out and found some gold. Do you still have the maps? Yes, I do. Meanwhile, back in the Philippines, the team continues excavating Breach 6. Based on a promising find. Looks like charcoal. And the Curtis tapes. The map show about 10 feet below the surface and was a layer of charcoal. Charcoal at 10 feet. We got charcoal at 10 feet. Rick checks the area for other materials that could indicate they're heading towards the metal deposit revealed by the tech scans. I want to keep doing this as we work our way down to find something. To begin with, when we started this shaft, we lined it up on top of a ferrous metal line that we were picking up all across this whole ridge. We're down in the ground a long ways at this point. We're going to be scanning the dirt outside of the hole. We've got something going on here. Yeah, that's a definite hit. Uh-oh, uh, uh, 
There it is. The heck is that? I can't say for sure what this is. That's surprisingly well intact, but it's underneath an awful lot of dirt. Hey, Brent, Farrell, I found something. Here you go, man. Take a look at this, man. I found a metal detector in that last bucket that came up out of there. That's a pretty old piece of equipment, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, it really is. You know what it looks like? It looks like the bands on our fin hose, like off a tool, like a band around the handle of a tool or something, too. Oh, yeah. How there's a possibility. That looks like a magazine off a rifle. I've had enough dealing with firearms in my lifetime. I know what a magazine looks like, the part that slides up underneath. Either hold a clipper to pop shells down in. I really do need to have somebody look at this that knows more about it than I do. While Rick awaits answers to what this is and who it belonged to, miners Levi and Geo are clearing out the collapsed tunnel. <laughs> What is that? That ain't no rock. Whoa, dude, what is that? There's another one. What is that? Is that a tooth? I don't know what or who these belong to, but at this point, we're pulling out. We're going to get John down here and have him take a look and see what he thinks. Check this out. There's more in there, too, John. Yeah, it's right at the edge of a collapse. Let's grab our stuff. I'll take you in there and show you where we found it at. Oh, man. I found that tooth right in here. I didn't even notice these before. There's more teeth. We dug these out. I don't know if those belong to a shoulder blade or a rib or what that is. Do you think it could possibly be a human? Oh, my god, I hope not. Well, you know, the Japanese were notorious for leaving their engineers and all the slaves inside the tunnel. I'm hoping this isn't it. And yeah. once you find bones like this, we've got to get it checked out. You can't do anything else in here until that. Let's get somebody out here, check this out, and make sure it's not a human. Let's pray. This is a this is a problem. You know, right now we're shut down until we can figure out what this is. Got to get a specialist out here and find out what these bones are about. Not knowing if these are human, it's only right to shut down this location until we figure out exactly what these bones are. So yeah, no more digging. That works for me. I don't want to dig up no grave site. In San Francisco, Bingo is meeting with Chuck McDougald who claims to have maps to Yamashita treasure sites. Do you have the maps here that I can look at? I mean, I'd, I'd love to look at the maps. Come with me. Well, this is everything I have. Is this all your research from your whole time spent in the Philippines? Yes. They've been sitting in the attic for 25 years. Oh, uh, here. Let me help you with this. OK. Uh, just here? Have a, yeah. This contains the maps that uh, were given to me in the Philippines. Wow. Are these and the original maps here? Those two are the original maps. These are incredible. I've never seen anything like this in, yeah. in any of my research. This is rice paper waxed over. It has a wax feel to them, yes. Yeah. Let's see. What else do we have? This is Count McKinley, now called Fort Bonifacio. This is the circle driveway in Camp McKinley. In the center is a shaft. There are 14 tunnels that lead to treasure buried by the Japanese. I think Marcos recovered this one. 
If Marcos did, in fact, extract treasure from this site, I mean, that's very valid proof that a number of these maps could potentially be actual treasure sites. Correct. What is the value here that's listed at the bottom of these maps? That's the value of the map in the 1940s. So of each site, that's how much is potentially buried in that spot? Yes. I mean, that's nine zeros there. So 555 billion yen, roughly 5 billion US at the time. Yes. That's astronomical. We're literally holding pieces of history right here. So why didn't you go back to the Philippines to try and recover any of these? Well, I tried, but they asked me to leave. And I didn't think I was welcome back there anymore. Maybe if you were open to it, I mean, we can have this authenticated by some experts and figure out the authenticity of it, seeing if these are, in fact, of the time period of the era. Would you be open to something like that? A absolutely. Back in the Philippines, the horizontal drill is still fighting its way up the mountain. Not looking too good. It looks like we had some pretty deep mud again from some more rains. Who do we got on an escalator right now? I think Michelle's over there running right now. I could probably get her over here with it. You want me to try? Yeah. Michelle tries using the excavator to lift the drill out of the mud. Got the strap there? Yeah, we have some shackles. It's just critical right now that we get this there. You know, John is anxious, I'm anxious. We want to see if we can punch into this cavity and if we can get a camera and see this treasure. We have to do this. At base camp. Hey, Rick, how are you? Rick checks in with military expert Craig Gottlieb about the mysterious metal artifact he discovered at Breach 6. Well, I am really excited to see what you think. Well, it's part of a rifle. What you've got is the magazine body of a Japanese Type 99 Arasaka rifle. Wow, man, that's awesome. The Type 99 Arasaka rifle was one of the premier combat weapons of the Japanese Imperial Army, built to the same rugged standards of America's M1 Garand and Germany's Karabina 98. So this is a later in the war rifle. Uh, they started producing them in 1941, and they produced them on through 1945. The Arasaka Type 99 was considered one of the strongest military rifles ever made. So it is Japanese and it was used during the Second World War. Absolutely. I am a gun collector. I happen to have one right here. I want to show it to you because I want to show you where your part goes. Here is my Type 99 Japanese Arasaka rifle. And I'm going to actually take the bolt off. It comes out. And here's what you've got. If you look inside the rifle, you have that follower in there, OK, which is where you, you load your cartridges. OK? But if you look on the bottom here, you've got a little plate. And if you pull this little lever here, the bottom plate rotates out. And it's sort of hard to see. But if you look down in this well here, you'll see your part. Your part is part of the rifle. And it doesn't just come out. And what's really interesting is that you only found this piece. The question is, how did it get outside the rifle? Because as I said before, it's not something you drop when you're out of ammo. Does it come out at all, or does the rifle have to be broken for it to come out? It either has to be broken or disassembled. This part does not come out, and that's why I say it's not part of a magazine. It's part of the rifle itself, and it's inside the rifle. Uh, it's getting kind of exciting when you start finding Japanese rifle parts in the bottom of your shaft, and you're looking for Japanese buried treasure. It tells you more than the knife you found tells you, in my opinion. I don't think a civilian carried a rifle like this into your breech and dropped it like may have happened with the knife. I really think that this part was dropped there sometime prior to 1945. Well, what we do know for a fact now is somebody with a Japanese rifle, probably a Japanese soldier, was in breech six. That tells me we're getting really close. 
As the sun rises over base camp, a local scientist arrives to investigate a macabre discovery the team uncovered deep inside the tunnel. Good morning, sir. John Casey. Hi, good morning. I'm Philip. While clearing out debris from a collapse, miners Levi and Geo found bones and teeth. If they are human, the team must stop exploring here and call in local authorities. John called me to help him out identify the bones that he found inside the mine tunnel. In my line of work, I've done several identification of bone fragments. I've worked with describing new species based on bone morphology for several years now. Wow. I'm here to figure out if the bones that were found in the tunnel would be human. Oh, okay, so we have here all right, so some molars. You can see we got some bone oh. fragments here. Wow. Oh. Yeah, so one of the vertebral column, probably along the lumbar area. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one, not entirely sure. Well, at this point, now. It's pretty difficult to tell what kind of bone is it. You don't think they're possibly human bones? I have no idea. Pending tests. Anything that you can do to test this and let us know definitively is going to be major to us doing any other work in this tunnel. Uh, well, uh, first I'm going to do is uh, take photographs at the site. I just found nine different bone fragments in there, and surprisingly in fairly good condition. I found several pieces of vertebrae, different parts of a scapula or your shoulder blades, and I found three pieces of teeth. We're gonna get these bones tested. The tunnel is now shut down until further notice. Later that day, Bingo updates John and Rick about his meeting with treasure hunter Chuck McDougald, who holds what could be game-changing treasure maps he obtained in the Philippines. I got some incredible news for you. I just found Chuck. He's in San Francisco. Chuck McDougald has 20-some-odd Yamashita treasure maps. Wow. Two of the maps were originals. Did he say where he got these things? He got them from Dr. Soriano, who was the chancellor of the University of Philippines at the time. He got them out of President Marcos' office. So me and Chuck, we brought these to be authenticated uh, to Jerry Laporte, who's a forensic chemist and document dating specialist. We wanted to see if we could find anything about the origin or even the validity of the map. We did a number of tests. Some of them, they were ink impression, the medium used, even the ink itself. The conclusion we came to is that the creation of this document um, and the technology used to create it is from the 1970s not an original, but likely a copy that was used in the field. Totally makes sense that it's a copy. I wouldn't want to take the original map into the field, even if we had it. Have you got the thing in your hands? Yeah, unfortunately, you wouldn't let any of them out of the site. What are you guys thinking? Should we try and set up a partnership with Chuck so we can get access to the map? If these are real maps, and there's a real map of our mountain, it could be the thing that cracks this mountain wide open. Let's figure out what he needs, Make sure that it's reasonable, but let's do a deal. Sounds good, gentlemen. I'll get it set up. I'm going to get in touch with Chuck. As soon as I make any headway with that, I'll let you know. That evening, John checks on the progress of the horizontal drill. I don't know if he's going to make it. I think he will. It's pretty steep. It gets further every time. I think you should keep trying. just about had it. I mean, you were, you were getting so close. As soon as you got the slop out of the way, got some purchase, he was coming. Yeah. And once you hit the slop again, it was just back down. That rain didn't help. With the rig stuck fast, the team calls in the excavator to help. Hey, Michelle, you got a copy? Using a heavy-duty cargo strap, 
Michelle lifts the back end of the drill with the excavator bucket, hoping to nudge it up the road. It's gonna make it. Broke it or slipped off? I think it broke. Yeah, it keeps going to the side. Excuse me. Oh. It keeps sliding. Yeah, it keeps sliding sideways. So I just can't get enough side. purchase here. We'll uh, we'll get Michelle to plant the bucket behind the machine. It can't go nowhere. It can't both machines don't go nowhere tonight. Pick this up at daylight. This is getting too dangerous for us to do anything here in this slop. Fair enough? All right. Cool. Thanks. All right, Shell. We're going to put the bucket to brace the drill, make sure it can't go anywhere for the night, and we're going to call it quits and come back when we can see. I got to tell you, I, I don't know if it's going to be worth it. It's such a long shot to get this drill and this target to begin with. We're going through all this aggravation and danger possibly for nothing. No, I can't think of any other way to get to that waterfall. You know, we're all tired, we're all discouraged. I'm discouraged. Tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow. All right, good deal. Right, Thanks, guys. The only way to keep the morale up on the team is just, you know, tell them we're gonna persevere and don't let this stop you. I don't let anything stop me. No people, no mountain, no rain is going to stop me. Once my mind is set on something, I'm going to do it. I don't care what it takes. As morning arrives, Rob assesses how to get the drill rig over the final incline. Well, this whole situation is dangerous in general. We have several tons of machinery that we have humans standing in between. Just about anything can go wrong, and if it does, it would be catastrophically wrong. I don't think there's a whole lot of margin for just a couple of bumps and scrapes here. Okay, Michelle, I should be okay. Just back it out from there, please. So the plan is to have Michelle move the excavator out of the way and Andrew's gonna get on the drill rig and back it down somewhere stable while we clean up the path and get it to be something that he could drive over and get it to this drill pad. The plan is to clear away the mud, then lay down a mixture of sand and fine gravel on top for the rig to gain traction. It's gonna be tough. Later, at base camp, Levi, Gio, and John eagerly await the results from the local scientist's bone analysis. If the remains are human, the tunnel will be shut down as local officials investigate. Hey, Philip. So I'm hoping that you have some news for us. Yeah, I have. I've made a lot of comparisons. Several bones that we collected from the tunnel. Some of them were parts of the backbone, some parts of the scapula or the shoulder blade, and a set of teeth. Based from my comparison, they're not human. Oh, good to hear that. Where are they from, though? So after doing the comparisons, uh, so they belong to a cow, and the set of teeth were from a pig. And these tunnels are way up in the mountains, so there won't be any reason for these domesticated animals to wander far into the mountains. So I am guessing that these were brought in as food or rations. Towards the end of World War II, as Japanese rations grew scarce, the Imperial Army slaughtered nearly two million Philippine livestock to feed their starving troops. Based on those samples, is it possible to know how old those bones are? If you look at it just by sight, it's definitely older than the 30 years or so. So it could date from the time of the war. It's possible. It's possible. You know, this is great news for us, because now that the bones have been deemed non-human, they can continue working in the tunnel. Back in San Francisco, Bingo negotiates a partnership with Chuck that includes access to his maps. Personally, based on what I've seen, I believe a lot of these maps are real. I really think that they're is something here that can help us on our search. They're the most sophisticated maps of treasure I have ever encountered. So many codes, so many symbols, but I never expected to be back in this business. I 
I mean, really, that at the end of the day, we need access to these maps. You know, I think between just the two of us alone and my team in the Philippines, I think we have a winning formula here. We have what it takes to, to get this treasure. And I mean, to that end, what's it gonna take to get you on board? I don't think it's an accident that uh, we stumbled on each other after my stuff being hidden away in the attic for 25 years. I think if these maps are used to successfully conclude a treasure hunt, if treasure's found, mm -hmm. then uh, I would share in that. I'm not trying to be greedy. 1% of the gross proceeds would be enough. If that's what it takes, then let's do it. Getting these maps is huge for us. If one of these maps is of our mountain, then that takes the guesswork out of a lot of what we've been doing. I mean, the guys are gonna be excited as hell to see this stuff. In the Philippines, it's all hands on deck to help the horizontal drill get over the final incline. After the loose mud is shoveled away, Michelle brings in nearly one ton of sand and gravel bags for the team to lay down by hand. Yep. This is our best shot of getting to this gold. Oh, give me one more. If this failed, I really don't know how we're going to get there. We know the target's there. Now we just got to get to it. Pray. And we got another maybe half an hour before thunderstorms roll through here. If that sky opens up right now and we'll start to pour, we'd lose all the work we just put into this. Freaking madman. If I carry two, I'd freaking be on my knees. <laughs> Come on, Levi, I don't do too much. I need you in one piece. Ultimately, we have to start drilling here. This is our best shot at seeing what's underneath that waterfall. This isn't good. Today is one small victory, but getting the drill here probably should have been the easy part. Drilling and hitting our target, I guess that's yet to be seen. They're finally ready to start drilling through 930 feet of hard rock to see what lies beneath the waterfall. Now it's time to aim this drill, and, and that is critical. I mean, 930 feet is a really long way to go, so all we can really do is aim at our best from the get-go, we want to go as straight as an arrow and go right into this void. It's got to be right. Well, it's given the coordinates that we've been given. This is going to be as close as we can get. Let's pray that it gets there and it uh, doesn't stray too far. camera in this void space and actually have a look at what's inside this mountain. 
on the next lost gold of World War II. The helicopter coming in. There's no reason for that helicopter to be circling around here. We're the only people on this mountain. Seeing as that we've lost all that circulation, if we don't touch anything after three feet, it's no good. What you got, Brent? Well, I got some timber, I think. Oh, oh yeah. that sounds Ooh. hollow. Oh, it's hollow. Moment of truth, are you ready? I'm way ready. See what this thing can do. What is that? That looks like a huge space. Oh, my God. Previously on Lost Gold of World War II. Holy <laughs> We got a major cave in. If we can't get around this collapse, then we'll never get inside the mountain to get this treasure. Xbox a spot. Knowing that there is a void space deep down underneath the waterfall, and knowing satellite has confirmed a big metal target there, this drill is our best bet to get there. I got some incredible news for you. I just found Chuck the Doodle. He has about 20 Yamashita treasure maps. Casey and Rick Hurt are back in the Philippines with a new team continuing their search for Yamashita's gold. We're going to find a way to get to this treasure. Like many others, John believes Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita took billions of dollars in treasure looted by Japan during World War II and buried it in the Philippines, including somewhere in this mountain. Following a series of mysterious symbols they believe were left by Yamashita, the team is investigating three sites. A waterfall. This waterfall is hiding something. A crater known as Breach 6. I've never seen anything like this. And a camouflage tunnel they uncovered last year. We are in the mount, boys. Can they finally discover the lost gold of World War II? Inside the tunnel, miners Levi and Gio are clearing a massive collapse. This is a mouse. This thing's caved in as far as I can see. I'll tell you, if you run into something like this, it's never easy to get through it. I mean, we're looking at a month, maybe two months of work to get around this thing. Based on recent discoveries of animal bones, and a World War II-era Japanese landmine, the team wants to continue exploration. Boy, very unstable ground. But this dangerous mess is stopping them dead in their tracks. Listen to it. You can hear the ground taking weight. Listen. I mean, you can see right there. Yeah. That there, that's the danger zone, man. Yeah. I've dealt with collapses like this in the past, and messing with these things, a lot of times you're opening a giant can of worms. We don't know the extent of it. We don't know how far it goes. We can't see the top of it. It's the unknown. Their only option is to tunnel around the collapse. But digging through hard rock presents a major challenge. Hear this? That's real rock. Yeah. Over here? It's mush. We want to be into this hard rock. We don't want to be into this mushy, nasty stuff. It's nearly impossible to go through this by hand. It's going to take way too much time. With all this hard work we put in, all the obstacles we've overcome, there's been so many different clues inside this tunnel. There's a really good chance that there's treasure at the end of it. Now, we got to make a plan of attack to go back in there and get around this collapse. Farther down the mountain, at Breach 6, miners Brent and Farrell continue their excavation, inching closer to the line of metal deposits detected by a recent scan. 15 feet deep, they've already unearthed a solid slab of man-made concrete and a four-inch thick layer of charcoal. 
both of which Robert Curtis also found at his treasure sites nearly 30 years ago. Located about 10 feet below the surface was a layer of charcoal. According to Robert Curtis, the Japanese were leaving layers as an indicator to find treasure. Rick also recently discovered part of a buried Japanese World War II military rifle here. You have a Type 99 Japanese Arasaka rifle. All signs suggesting they could be on the right track. All the things we found, it's like driving me forward to want to get down to the bottom. It's encouraging me, and it's showing me that it's like we're actually on to something here. I'm not really sure what I have here. Kind of red like clay, but it's rock hard. Hey, Johnny. Yeah? You come on down here for a minute. OK. Not sure what it is, Johnny, but it's all over down here, dude. It's really, really hard, and I could break it in my pipe branch. Kind of a stone, but. Oh, it looks like slate or granite. It's got to be. Well, it's like a granite countertop. You're right. It's what it looks like, dude. I mean, there's three flat sides on that one. I'm going to dig a little bit more, dude. I'll see how much more I can find here. <laughs> stone we just uncovered kind of looks like a uh, granite of some kind. It's got machined edges here and there. It's broken up. It's just been straight through. Like, and it's like a consistent layer all the way through. I say we stuff our pockets full of this stuff and head back to base camp show the boys. Over at the borehole site, Rob and drill operator Andrew make slow but steady progress across the mountain. We're in about 100 feet. We've got a ways. We're looking at a little over 900 feet to our target, so we're a little over a tenth of the way there. The horizontal drill is their last option to reach metal deposits identified below the waterfall. Knowing where the treasure is is one thing. Getting to the treasure is something else. Since environmental restrictions prevent them from digging at the waterfall, they're drilling horizontally 930 feet through the mountain towards the void space so they can feed in a borehole camera. There's lots of borehole cameras that will make it 930 feet to see exactly what we've hit. For the three-inch drill to hit the void space from 930 feet away, it must maintain pinpoint accuracy. I'm getting more and more anxious because as we move further in, our ability to make a correction starts to shrink down by a lot. If the drill is knocked off course by even a few degrees, it could miss the void entirely by the time it reaches target depth. Well, about how long are you thinking until we pull the next sample? Why is that pulling out? My son, pulling the whole thing. They need to constantly monitor coarse soil samples taken by the drill to ensure the bore hasn't shifted. If the samples stay the same, they know they are on the right directional track for the void. We're about to pull about another four and a half feet of a core sample. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that it's that exact consistent type of rock that we know is going to keep us on a straight path. Yeah, we have another small weathered formation here. This is ideal. The less of this, the better. We can minimize the amount of broken ground. We've got more chance of keeping it straight. What are we looking at, Andrew? Um, this is the last piece we've just pulled out recently. It looks like we're coming into a bit of a uh, fracture formation. Maybe even a fault. Yeah, it's like decomposed. So now that I see this, it's a little bit concerning. But things like this might be a little bit of an issue. We we'll just have to monitor it with the survey, mate. That's all we can do is work it out from there. They also need to monitor any changes that could jeopardize the expensive machinery. I'm going to just keep a steady course. We don't want to push too hard. Uh, push too hard if it causes us to deviate. So just got to keep an eye on this. 
Rob Cert might be on a lot of pressure here. You know, this is a long shot by far. You know, when you got to drill 900 feet with a little three inch drill to a little spot, maybe 20 by 20, you know, underneath the waterfall, it's a, it's a hell of a task. I mean, we're not that far in yet, or only about 100 feet, but with 800 feet to go, anything could happen. Seeing that, Ralph? An helicopter coming in. Rick, you seeing that helicopter? He just got buzzed. Yeah, I sure did, John. Uh, he came right over us. Kind of did two little circles right over the top of Breach 6. It's a little disconcerting. I was trying to get my uh, phone camera on it to zoom in to see if I could get numbers, but I... Uh... I was too slow. Copy. Yeah, I see it right there. It's two of them. There's another one behind it. It's the first time they've spotted aerial surveillance in the two years they've worked here. We've been warned about being watched by somebody. They know exactly what you're doing. They know exactly where you are. The team's new partner, experienced treasure hunter Chuck McDougall, also warned them. There are people that are going to observe everything you do. And if and when they think you've found a treasure, that they might step in and uh, either steal it from you or just kill you right then and there. I'm just wondering if they just came in for a quick check on our progress. Copy that. All right, just keep an eye open and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just another damn thing to worry about. If you're going after a treasure like this, chances are somebody's watching. At the tunnel, father and son miners Geo and Levi bring in a remote-controlled demolition robot to help dig around the collapse. Hopefully, this thing here will be our saving grace, and it'll make stuff go a lot faster. It's like a mama excavator packing its little baby, packing it back to its nest. This is it, huh? That's it. You know, it's the same color as a lemon, right? This thing's going to save you. You want to keep shoveling? I can take it back. But I got to see it to believe it. I well, don't know. Well, you can go in there and pickaxe it. it. It's a little small, though, isn't it? Hey, man, dynamite comes in small packages. OK. Remote-controlled demolition robots are often used in the mining industry, where it is unsafe or inefficient to work by hand. They're equipped with multiple attachments, ranging from cutters to claws. But their primary tool is a hydraulic hammer chisel that can strike with up to 2,320 pounds per square inch of pressure. At a rate of 680 strikes per minute, this machine gets the job done in a fraction of the time it would take to shovel out the debris by hand. The only way that we're going to know what's inside the tunnel is to get past the big, massive cave-in and, and find out where this thing goes. Drop the downriggers now. Moment of truth, are you ready? I'm wearing. See what this thing can do. Chews it up, man. Definitely breaking rock. We got a goal. That goal is to get to the gold. We're not taking no for an answer. At base camp, Rick and John get an update from Bingo. Bingo. Good morning, guys. How y'all doing? We're doing good. While searching for Yamashita treasure maps, Bingo was introduced to an associate of the late Robert Curtis. Chuck McDougall. He's one of those experts on this whole Yamashita gold story. While meeting with McDougald, Bingo got his hands on treasure maps Chuck obtained from the office of former Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos. These are incredible. I've never seen anything like this in, yeah. in any of my research. We're literally holding pieces of history right here if he did, Correct. in fact, recover this treasure. After negotiating a deal... I think if treasure's found, I would share in that. And if that's what it takes, then let's do it. McDougall agreed to share the maps, hoping one of them could be their mountain. 
I got some great news for you guys. Check it out. The Golden Lily treasure map. Really? Unbelievable, man. Is it the real deal? That's great. I think this one in particular looks a lot like our mountain. What makes you think it's a map of our mountain? There's there's a number of features on here that made me that made me think it looked like our mountain in particular. I mean, there's some mountaintops here. There's a waterway that goes through it, and there's this this area in, in the middle here that I believe looks like Breach Six. It's almost like a schematic of what it would look like. Oh, Bingo, I'm starting to see what you're seeing. So you can kind of see uh, something that looks like it could be the pyramid rock. I think you're onto something here. I'm glad you guys are seeing the same thing I was seeing. I wonder what all that other stuff means. I mean, I can't really see a scale on this, so we got some work to do. We're going to have to try to figure out all the rest of these things. Thanks again, Bingo. No worries, guys. I'll talk to you soon. John and Rick take a closer look at the map. There's so much stuff on this map, man. There, yeah, there's a huge amount of information on here. Look at this thing. I mean, I, I would like to know what the rest of this stuff means, but the river, you know, really, it matches our river in the bends and everything. I'm super interested in finding out anything about this area and these shafts. Yeah, you know, this this whole box thing in the center, I think that's, you know, pretty important. It's like one of the main features of all these arrows pointing to it. It's got to have some significance. There's a couple of things on the map that really make me believe it's a map of our mountain, but there's so much stuff on this map that we don't understand at this point. What's all this, like, grass up here? I mean, is it like bamboo or something? I don't know, man. What do you suppose this clock's all about up here? Based on my prior knowledge of treasure hunting and other people I've worked with, they've told me that this clock face represents direction markers and the amount of paces you would need to go to get to that marker. You know, there's a lot of stuff here, like all these holes here, whatever this is. You know, I don't know if this is a cross-section of that or this is a cross-section of this. It's great to have a map, but there's no scale on this map. There's no references. Whether it's our mountain or not, I just don't know. So if we want to get to use the map to our advantage, we're going to need to figure out whether this map actually is our mountain. After discovering an unusual rock layer in Breach 6, the team sent geologist Gerard Mulzoff a piece for analysis. We sent you over that sample. Uh, were you able to find any information about it? Yeah, absolutely. We went through a number of simple geologic tests to help determine what minerals and what rock this is. First thing we did is we put a little dilute hydrochloric acid and it fizzed wildly. We also utilized the latest technology, LIBS, or LIBS. What it does is it actually fires laser beams down onto the stone, surface of the stone, and produces a plasma. And it reads the plasma and determines what the elements are and what their relative percentages. So we came up with calcium, carbon, and oxygen, and then quite a bit of iron, which is certainly the reason why this material is so red, confirming a marble. Red marble, no Red less. marble, yeah. That's the weirdest thing ever. Find marble in a place like this all broke up. While searching for Yamashita's treasure in the Philippines, Robert Curtis found marble. There was this green marble. Come from a very long way from where we're finding it. As did Chuck McDougald. During the uh, dig at Fort Santiago, at the 40 meter level, we encountered marble and gold flecks on our drill on our drill bit. It was already in the maps that they built the marble fortifications before bringing in the treasure. That's amazing. So, John, what's really interesting about this is it is not native to the Philippines. That's incredible. This nodular texture that we see here it is almost as unique as a fingerprint. We've got some white calcite vein here. This is all highly special. Mm. So I've actually tracked down the exact quarry that this came from. This is actually French marble. Wow, I wasn't expecting you to say that. France. And what's so unique about this is this particular quarry has been known to have been mined since the first century BC by the Romans. Holy smokes. 
and King Louis XIV used this quite regularly in the palace at Versailles. So this is a very famous marble. This was the king's quarry. This red marble famously originates in a quarry in southern France. It's possible Japanese forces looted it when they conquered French colonies in Asia during World War II. But it's also possible that the marble was seized by Germany when it occupied France and then given by the Nazis to their Japanese allies, including General Yamashita. In 1940, he spent six months in Germany on a secret intelligence mission, even meeting with Adolf Hitler. The marble's presence here could suggest one shocking possibility, a treasure so vast that the Nazis and Yamashita were cooperating. How in the world did it ever get in the bottom of a hole in the Philippines? We know this is special. We know this came a long way to get there. We can only speculate how it got there. Thank you again. We do appreciate everything you've done for us. Anytime. We'll talk to you soon. You know, what's significant about this marble discovery at Breeze 6 is that it's certainly not a natural occurrence. So somebody put this red marble in that hole for a reason. And what is the reason? Does it indicate that we're getting closer? Does it indicate that we are on top of a treasure? The only way we're going to find out is to keep going deeper inside that mountain and see what it is. Intrigued by the red marble discovery, John heads over to Breach 6. Brent and Farrell are digging through multiple layers as they're going down through Breach 6. I want to know, how did all these layers end up in our hole? We find all kinds of random things, and then we come across this red rock. It's like a marble. We're back into, like, it's like a hard clay type of layer. It's not really wanting to come out real quick. An 8 by 8 hole is a big hole to hand dig. It's just huge, and it's just wearing on us. All right, hopefully we can hit something exciting here pretty soon. I'm getting pretty tired of just digging clay. As the team digs, they notice the arrival of unanticipated guests, local inspectors. Like the earlier helicopter flyover, this kind of unannounced visit is unusual, and it strikes alarm bells in John. Normally, if there's an inspection going to occur, you know, they'll call me up and say, hey, we're coming out to the site today to give you an inspection. These guys just showed up out of nowhere. We disturb you a minute. I'd like yeah. you to meet our inspector. Sam. How's Sam. it going, man? Over there is Tony. They're paying us a visit. They said, oh, we're here. We're to inspect the site. And, you know, we're just making sure that we've got all the right permits, make sure that the use of heavy equipment and the people are around it are doing it safely. So what is the purpose why they put charcoal? We get frequent scheduled visits from the government to make sure we're in compliance. So we get inspectors showing up just whenever they want. It's something we've never had before. They're kind of looking across at the different sites with cameras. You know, it's a little disconcerting. So I think uh, the falls is over there. So yeah, falls is up we, and over the top. Uh, penetrate over there? That's the plan. So hopefully he can get down underneath the falls. So, so we can this see. is a diversion not to... Uh, to work so to close work to the water. So we're stay totally away from the waterfall. Makes me a little nervous because we've got a lot of things going on. I can only be in one place at one time, and I can't keep an eye on everything that's going on at any given moment. Maybe they're thinking we're getting close. Following up on Bingo's lead, John and Rick reach out to their new partner, Chuck McDougald a contemporary of Robert Curtis, who hunted Yamashita's treasure here in the 1980s, he's agreed to lend his intel for a share of whatever they find. Charles McDougall's a treasure hunter legend in the Philippines. He was one of the first people to come here and work at Fort Santiago with Bob Curtis, trying to recover a treasure there. And he got really close to recovering that treasure before the government came in and basically shut him down. I've been searching for a way into these tunnels, but the map could really be the key to us actually getting in there. Good morning, Chuck. Nice to meet you, sir. Same here. We got the copy of the map that you sent over. It has really a lot of similarities to our mountain. 
especially in an area that we call Breach 6. And that's pretty intriguing. We're hoping that you can shed some more light on some of the other features on this map and maybe help us line that up to what we have on the mountain here. So we can actually start building a scale for ourselves and possibly confirm that this map is actually to this mountain. Based on the other maps, which have very similar wavy lines, my guess is that they're waterfalls. Waterfall, we've got that waterfall. Hey, Chuck, you know, we have waterfalls on our property. And we've done a lot of work around this waterfall because there are a lot of rock markers there that indicate that something was going on there. But there's still no definitive way to get in there. Well, if you look at the map, to me, that upside down U could be a tunnel entrance in the water. And on each side of this trapezoid is a small ellipse, four of them. Mm -hmm. And those four dark colored ellipses, my theory is that they are access points to going to the main tunnel. Well, in the, in the center of the map, there's a giant box there with kind of an X. It's kind of shaded out. And then it's got, you know, four arrows actually pointing to the box. Do you have any idea what that may indicate? The 20 or 30 maps I have um, all are very, very similar with, with these markings. I don't know for sure, but the, the, the arrows coming from each side my guess is that's an indicator that that's a very important area. Mm -hmm. uh, why? We don't know yet. But there could be treasure in that area. Wow. It's hit and miss. But I would say that you're on the right path. But again, be careful. Chuck, I can't even say thank you enough. You've shed so much light on something that was a big mystery to us. Thank you, my pleasure. The next morning, excavation continues at Breach 6. After learning the marble they found originated in a rare quarry in France. So guys, this nodular texture that we see here is very unique. Rick believes they could be on the verge of finally hitting their target. Ever since we found that marble, I know that there's something down this shaft. We hit layer after layer after layer of indicators. So we think we're going to hit something significant very, very soon. Winter down for me, boy. Winter down, yeah. Getting pretty deep. The plan this morning, we're going to get back in the hole. We're just going to dig. We're going to move muck out of the hole until we get to the bottom of this thing. Nothing too cool yet. Hold that thought. What'd you find? I think I got a big piece of wood, dude. For sure. Oh, wow, that's a big one. I got some timber, I think, it's laying down. Oh my gosh, man. I just hope it's not like the top of something. Does it sound hollow at all? Oh, oh. Yeah, oh, it's hollow. Is he breaking through that? Dude, I just poked through it in my shovel. It's really rotten, but there's a, some kind of a void underneath it. You know, I think I'd feel better if you guys would throw me a line. Roger. Got to go really careful from here. I think we landed right on top of the void space. So if we can just keep proceeding carefully, we may be into this tunnel in short order, hopefully. That'd be a good idea, man. You don't need that bottom dropping out from under you. You know what? Just give me a little slack on the cable, and I'll hook up to that. Give me two feet. I'm harnessing up here because I don't want to take the chance to fall into something. I mean, if it's holding up the whole world, I could be dropping down 20, 30 feet here if it or farther. This could be it, buddy. Could be it. I'm hoping it's it. All right, I'm going to try to open her up. Oh, man, I'm shaking inside. What the hell? Dude, 
that's oh a my gosh. huge piece of wood, man. Looks like there's probably a cap sitting here. Keep our fingers crossed, maybe we'll find a hole. At Breach 6, Rick and the miners unearth a promising new layer of material 20 feet below the surface. Oh my gosh, huge piece of wood, man. Oh. Keep our fingers crossed, maybe we'll find a hole. Brent, is it hollow underneath of it? There's just a small void underneath this lagging where the rock oh. hadn't got underneath it. All right, got it. So there's got to be more down there, man. What do we have here? It's round stock. So that's round stock, and it's laying down, which kind of leading me to believe that that this is completely collapsed. Hey, Brent. Yo, I just hit a big old chunk in round stock. I don't know, I'm kind of thinking it's a cap or a post laid over. It's laying down completely. A cap is a broad piece of wood placed at the top of a vertical post to increase the surface area it can support. If this is a cap, Brent may have found the top of an underground structure. I'm going to send you guys up the load because I'm running out of bucket room. We've got some pieces of timbering from down the bottom of the shaft. We're going to see if we can't kind of fit this together, try and make some sense out of it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's definitely a poster cap. I mean, look at the width on that piece. And this one looks like it's burnt. They could have burnt this wood to harden it up. Preserve it a little bit. Preserve it a little bit, make it uh, last a little longer. Or they may have blasted this thing shut or burnt it to the ground. Burned man. it to the ground. I don't know what to think at this point. I'm starting to wonder if this thing might have been like a vault. What it says to me, this was constructed to house something. And whatever it was housing is still in that hole. So somebody was trying to preserve something for a long time. They had something hidden down there. We found timber, but we haven't found any treasure yet. This could be a tunnel, could be a room. But until we get to the bottom, we're just not going to know. The next morning, John and Rob set out to check if some of the indicators on McDougald's map line up with locations on the mountain. We have the pyramid, and we have the waterfall site. So if we can use the drone to find some other markers that may pertain to other things on this map, a, it'll tell us that this map is possibly our mountain, and B, those markers that we do find could correlate to what's on this map. It may lead us to other entrances to their tunnels. I'm coming up on the river now, and I believe I'm looking at the waterfall right in front of me. I'll hang over that waterfall for a second. Let's look at that in correlation to what we have on the map. And you're on top of our waterfall. That gives us two points of reference, Breach 6 and the waterfall. If that's the case, we should be able to use the river as a guide to try to figure out those other symbols. Sure, it looks like the river bends back to the west and basically heads straight south. What is that? Oh, OK. You know, that's, that's from the last time we were here. That's our drilled tripod. Last year, John and his team drilled at a location they believed to be a Japanese tunnel entrance called the back door. I think it's a void. But as they excavated the area, all they found was murky water. Thinking it was a dead end, the team abandoned the site. You, you know, that's, that's weird, because that's, that line's right up to the map. Check this out. You came out of the bend, yeah, and you hit it right here, and that's almost right where the back door is. And on this map is right where the circle is. According to Chuck, that circle marker is a tunnel. I think that we should revisit that back door. So far, we've got a pretty good perspective on this whole map, and everything on that side has lined up. We know there's a cavity at the back door. And as much as we tried last year and couldn't get into it, I think it's pretty significant that it lines up to McDougall's map. Now more than ever, 
I want to get back down there and revisit this thing. I think we walked away too soon, but now we have the right equipment, the right testing. I think it's time to get back down there and try to get back in there. Later that day, Rob checks on the horizontal drill. We're over 200 feet in at this point. Everything's going well. The core samples, they all look really good. We're really getting back on track. We're back in the rock we want to be in. To keep the drill bit lubricated so it doesn't overheat and break, water continually cycles in and out of the borehole. What's going on? Seeing as that we've lost all that circulation, so before we had lots of water return, lots of circulation, yeah, yeah. now we've got none, so it's going somewhere else. The water pumping into the borehole has disappeared. Andrew thinks the drill punctured an unexpected void space, which the water is now draining into. But with their waterfall target still 700 feet away, this hole is a complete mystery. Where did it go? Well, it's gone into a formation. I'm not sure where it's gone, though. No, it's just gone. We'll test how wide the void is. If it's any more than two to three feet, then we'll have to pull the rod. If the heavy drill bit extends too far into a cavity unsupported, it could snap, particularly if lack of water circulation overheats the bore. This kind of damage could keep them from ever reaching the waterfall. If you don't touch anything after three feet, it's not good. So we'll mark out three feet. We're going to mark out the increments on the rods. He's going to push a section through. We're going to take a measurement and see how far across it takes before we're at something solid. Bring it in, please, mate, slowly, huh? Any resistance? I haven't felt anything yet. If there's something there, you'll feel it. Yeah, well, well we've, uh, we just went just past three feet, and um, we didn't touch the other side of whatever it is. What do we do now? What happens if we keep going? There's a fair chance that the core barrel will just break clean off the end of the rods. Uh, and it could end the hole. Throughout the mountain, the team is uncovering incredible clues, suggesting they could be getting closer to the treasure. But as excitement grows, so too does the risk. Seeing that, Rob? Helicopter coming in. After receiving several unexpected visitors, John worries the multiple warnings from Mr. X. They're watching you. They know exactly what you're doing. They know exactly where you are. And their new partner, Chuck, could be true. And if and when they think you've found a treasure, they might step in and either steal it from you or just kill you right then and there. As a result, John's hired security to safeguard the perimeters of their work sites. To protect this site, to protect our people, you know, it's best to have the right security team on site. We got security posted on every high point in this place, and I think we're good to go. Treasure hunting in general draws all kinds of people and mostly unwanted people to your site. You know, you put all this time and effort and research into a project to see fruition, and they're just going to wait for you to do all the hard work and then just come in guns a-blazing and take it from you. So anything we can do to avoid that situation is paramount here. Over at the tunnel, father and son miners, Gio and Levi, continue to forge ahead with the demolition robot. Working out here in the Philippines is definitely different. It's awesome getting to spend this experience with my dad. There's not another person I'd rather have here. Yeah! Talk your big chunks out. Surrounded by unstable rock, the pair remain vigilant. 
part of mining, you depend on your partner a lot because when you put on that hard hat and that light and you go underground, anything can happen. Watch that. My dad worked in the mines for almost 40 years. Ended up getting killed in the mine. So I'm constantly watching my son. He's constantly watching me. Working together, I feel way more secure. Meanwhile, John and Rob set up a borehole camera to examine the mysterious void the drill intersected 200 feet into the mountain. So now that we know we punched into this void space, we want to send the camera all the way down there and see what that anomaly is. That's good. Keep going. That down there. Looks like that's about the end of it there. It's getting, see that dark? Yeah, what is that dark hole? smokes that's a huge space i didn't expect that it's starting to look like a void space more than it is a fault line andrew well, definitely it's not a fault well, you guys said you hit something lost some water i'm figuring you hit a fault line see if you can twist it a little bit hang on oh what is that what is that now, let me see if i can get a better look at it right there Oh, my God, that is definitely a piece of wood. That's a timber. What would Jimmy be doing in that? Oh, my God. There's a nail there. You see it? Mm-hmm. That looks like a man-made tunnel. Oh, my God, I can't believe we're seeing this. On the next Lost Gold of World War II. Seeing all that wood and seeing that it's an actual tunnel, my gut feeling is that this tunnel leads right to the waterfall. They wouldn't have had this in World War II. I'm thinking somebody was here before us. Japanese military criminals confessed to save themselves. That's how MacArthur got the treasure. Is there any actual evidence to back this up? It's kind of extraordinary how much evidence. Hey, man, you got to get out of here. You got back to the go. Get out of here. Previously on Lost Gold of World War II. I'm not really sure what I have here. This is actually French marble. How in the world did it ever get in the bottom of a hole in the Philippines? Like it to meet our inspector. These guys just showed up out of nowhere. You know, it's a little disconcerting. Maybe they're thinking we're getting close. We know we punched into this void space. We want to send the camera all the way down there and see what that anomaly is. What is that? Oh, my God, that is definitely a piece of wood. That's a timber. Keep it coming. John Casey and Rick Hurt are back in the Philippines with a new team continuing their search for Yamashita's gold. We're going to find a way to get to this treasure. Like many others, John believes Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita took billions of dollars in treasure looted by Japan during World War II and buried it in the Philippines, including somewhere in this mountain. Following a series of mysterious symbols they believe were left by Yamashita, the team is investigating three sites. A waterfall. This waterfall is hiding something. A crater known as Breach 6. I've never seen anything like this and a camouflage tunnel they uncovered last year. We are in the mountain, boys. Can they finally discover the lost gold of World War II? In the Philippine mountains, at the borehole site. You seeing that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. John and his brother Rob are investigating a mysterious void the horizontal drill hit on its way towards the waterfall. Hold on, what is that? It's a timber. It's definitely a timber. There's a nail sticking out of it. That's freaking awesome. Look at that right there. That's definitely a nail. Absolutely. There's another nail. There's another one and a timber. 
At first, I thought this was a natural void space. Well, it doesn't look natural, whatever it is. So. No. Yeah, that's straight edge there. That's definitely man-made. There's no doubt about that. That timber looks like the ones that Levi and George are working in in their tunnel up there. I wonder if these two connect. Close to 200 feet underground. You know, it could be on a 45-degree angle, for all we know, going right to the treasure. I'm going to get this camera out of here. All right, well, let's get this tape over to Rick and the boys. For John, the discovery of a possible tunnel suggests maybe there's an easier way to get under the waterfall. If it's just a void in the rock that naturally Mother Nature made, you wouldn't be seeing pieces of wood in there. You wouldn't be seeing things that look like timbers in there and stuff that just doesn't belong in a natural void space. So somehow that stuff got in there. Later, at base camp, John gets the rest of the team up to speed. This isn't just a natural occurrence or a void space in the rock. Somebody put that there. There's no doubt about it. Exactly. And I'm thinking, if they put it there, we can get to it. We got to figure out a way to get in there. And we're trying to drill 900 feet to the room that's underneath the waterfall 300 feet down. Seeing all that wood and nails and seeing that it's an actual tunnel, does this tunnel go to the room underneath the waterfall? So maybe we won't have to expend so much energy going the rest of the way. Maybe we could just get to that tunnel and then walk right in. My gut feeling is that this tunnel leads right to the waterfall. I think you need to take a better look at these pictures mm -hmm. because you're opening a can of worms. You got a little void right there, and I can already tell you have a giant collapse here. I'm not trying to be the bearer of bad news, man, but the reality is this is probably an air pocket that you hit in that drift. It's probably caved in on both sides of it. There's not even anything here. What, what are we going to recover from this if we drive out there? A piece of wood and a nail? No, I was just thinking we're, once we get into that tunnel that we could just kind of muck it out and kind of go right towards the waterfall. Well, we have a tunnel that we're already in, and it's in a lot better shape than this. You have a void, and you have some wood with a nail in it. You guys are overlooking the big issue here. You're talking 200 feet down. You're talking a 200-foot shaft. You're talking a year and a half of work. I mean, it's a major especially with undertake. The especially with the resources we have here. It's not clam digger and a hoist. It's a shovel and a dude. We're running on what ifs. All we have here is timber and nails. My opinion, I think you keep drilling and see what you're going to hit out there. We get out to 1,000 feet, and you hit the treasure room, then we make a new plan. Yeah. By then, we'll be around the collapses, and we might already be there. As dawn breaks over breach six, excavation continues towards metal deposits detected over 20 feet below the surface. After the major discovery of red marble. I'm not really sure what I have here. Determined to be quarried from France, King Louis XIV used this in the palace at Versailles. So this is a very famous marble. With further confirmation from their treasure hunting partner, Chuck. It was already in the maps that they built the marble fortifications before bringing in the treasure. And the Robert Curtis tapes. So this is green marble. Marble. At 25 feet and still no sign of treasure, Rick's getting impatient. We're making good progress at Breach 6, but I would have thought we've reached something by now. We're down there quite a ways. We've run into timbers. Oh, oh. yeah. Ooh. Oh, it's hollow. I can't really think of another reason that there'd be wood down there. We've made it through the marble layer, and based on what we've seen with the Bob Curtis tapes, that's usually the last indicator before you get to whatever it is, whether that's a treasure vault or whether that's a tunnel. We are expecting to hit something very soon. Got some paint on it, but I can't really tell what it's saying. That is a double block I just found out here. And that's what you would use to raise or lower something out of a shaft like this if you didn't have a winch. Hey, Johnny. 
Brent. It's a big old double block, dude. It's Brent. old. I don't know how old it is. It's pretty good shape. Keep digging, buddy. Yeah, dude, keep digging, man. Dude. Look at this. I just short chunk of rope. I think I cut it with the fin hoe. Well, uh, I'm going to throw this in the can if you want to get it up out, and I'll keep digging. We found some blocks. We found some rope. We found all kinds of interesting things. Right now, we're not finding anything else. I don't know, man. We got to we gotta figure this out. I mean, we're down there. We're in the right spot. We're there. Dude. It's a pickhead. There's no handle at all in it, so if the handle's rotted out of it, then it might be old. We were expecting to hit a void space or a tunnel. We've had plenty of evidence to let us know we're in the right spot. After we got through the marble layer at the bottom of breach six, what we're actually running into now are tools. There's got to be an access to a tunnel. There's got to be something. Deep in the Philippine jungle, father and son miners Levi and Gio are making steady progress with their demolition robot. We're trying to get around the collapse in the tunnel. We've been in there chipping away. They're building a parallel passageway to bypass the cave-in. We've come a little over 40 feet right now. We should have been broke through already. There's a possibility that we could have missed our mark. You know, I hope we didn't. You know, looks can be deceiving. I think we're close. But we don't have no idea what that drift is doing on the other side of us. There we go. We got about 20 feet more to go right now. So we got a lot of work ahead of us. This is brutal, man. I'm hoping if we break through into the tunnel that it's open and it's not collapsed, that it's in good shape, where we can just get in there and start bolting and make some headroom. When you go into an old tunnel like this, there's a lot of different stuff you have to worry about. We've already dealt with booby traps. We're going to deal with bad ground. There's bad gases you can get into. We're going to have to use due diligence. We're going to have to take our gas detectors, make sure we're checking them. It's just hard saying. You get into those old tunnels, a lot of gases that you get will hang at knee high. As soon as you start to walk through them, you'll start stirring them up. Tough way to do her, man, hand mucking it, man. It's freaking tough on a young guy, let alone an old guy. We're hoping we find a network of tunnels that may lead us up below the waterfall where maybe there's gold. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to find some sort of treasure here. Down the mountain, John and Rick sift through the latest discoveries found at Breach 6. How far down below the marble did you find this? Probably at about five feet. How far down are you? Oh, gosh, man, we're 25 feet. You should be right at it. We've been looking. Got some more stuff. Put your rope. Dude. Hey, guys. Dude, check this stuff out. I got a little baby hammer. Wow. A bunch more rope. Keep finding the rope. I think I'm chopping it up as I'm digging. I just keep getting it out in little pieces, but. Yeah, it's probably so rotten. Been yeah. down there forever. Send that bucket of stuff up here. Let's examine it. Seeing this, Rick? Lots of digging tools. Just a steel. Yeah, an old pick, a little pin yeah. hammer. This stuff was in one spot, then I could see how the mag would pick it up. John's concerned the tools could be the metal hits detected by the magnetometer scan the tech team conducted weeks ago. Anything more down there? Nothing left down there at all. I scraped not, the whole it's thing. It's not concrete cap. It's just rock. Yeah, let's see what we really got here. We got this giant bar, this hammer. 
What are you digging, Jewel? Well, it's pick handle. You know, it's a little off center. But it's not very worn. On this bar, it's a little gnarled over on the edge. But the point on it's almost pristine. Yeah. I mean, you could have, like, you've been using this to pry crates open with. You know, this rope is pretty curious. You know, look at this. As I unwind it, you know, this is like almost like blue nylon rope. I mean, I know it's old and dirty looking, but. They wouldn't have had this in World War II. You know, this is kind of concerning to me, you guys. I'm thinking somebody was here before us. I mean, I know it's old looking, but there was a nylon rope around yeah. back in World War II. Nylon is a synthetic fiber developed by the DuPont Chemical Company in 1938. Considered stronger than silk, nylon was first used to make women's stockings before drafted to create parachutes and flak jackets for Allied forces during World War II. Because DuPont was working exclusively with the US military, Historians believe nylon technology did not reach Japan until after the war. How in the world would they got in there? I'm pretty sure I would have seen something if there had been any other way in that hole. I mean, you had that hard layer, and then everything underneath it was kind of loose, just like dirt like this and rocks. It is solid. I mean, it's just solid rock. This is all modern stuff. Over the past few weeks, what is that? Look like to you. It looks like a big hard rock or a big hard chunk of concrete. The team has found undisturbed layers of concrete, charcoal, and marble. So they didn't come up from the bottom. They didn't come down from the top. These modern tools suggest someone found another way to get to the bottom of Breach Six. The only thing I could figure to do would be to go down there, fire up a jack leg, and start rattling on the walls just see if we could find a soft spot or a narrow shell. You know, it wouldn't have to be big. I know you guys are thinking like mine shaft, like size, but you know, if you go like to Vietnam or even in Japan, you know, a lot of little tunnels are in there. I mean, we're talking like a tunnel like this wide, just enough for a little guy to squeeze through. It didn't have to be huge. If Brent and Farrell find a tunnel, it could confirm John's suspicion that another treasure hunter beat them to the punch. So you're seeing timbers. Yeah, guys, there's definitely a tunnel going this way, man. Can you get all the way through it, you think, or what? I'm not even going to go into it, man. It's, it's completely caved in. I mean, I'll poke my head in, but look how blown out it is. It's blown out all the way back there. All the timbers broke. So I mean, it totally collapsed. Oh, yeah. It's caved completely tight. Every timber in there snapped or rotten. It's, it's no go. We can't get into it. Whoever got in there took what they could, and they got out. This is not the way I wanted this story to end. After hitting a dead end at Breach 6, John and Rick turned their attention to the Golden Lily map given to them by famed treasure hunter Chuck McDougald. I'm not trying to be greedy. 1% of the gross proceeds will be enough. After negotiating a partnership, McDougald helped decode a map that looks similar to their mountain. Those four dark colored ellipses, my theory is that they are access points to the main tunnel. Based on his intel, John and Rob scanned the mountain to look for entrances identified by Chuck, including an old site from last year. You came out of the bend. Yeah, and you hit it right here, and that's almost right where the back door is. 
And on this map is right where this circle is. Now that we've kind of delineated a couple other spots based on flying the drone over it, you know, there are more possibilities on this map. You know, so we have breach six here, and we have this diagram saying, you know, tunnel going that way. You know, maybe it's possible that these two tunnels running off of here is really like a tunnel that ran through the middle of Breach 6, like we always thought. Last year, we thought that from the back door to Breach 6, it ran in a straight line. And maybe this diagram is saying that, too. According to Chuck McDougall, these symbols indicate three boxes of gold buried on this mountain. Although recent evidence suggests the treasure from Breach 6 may have already been recovered, there still could be two boxes left. At the back door last year, I mean, we did punch in to the bottom half or the back side of a void space. Mm -hmm. We just couldn't do anything with it. There's got to be another access into this back door somewhere. Maybe Max and Colin, with a little more scan work, they can find an access over there that's shallower. That might be our Hail Mary. Well, if there's an easier way to get into this tunnel system, I think it's a good shot. In the US, head researcher Bingo Minerva is trying to figure out who else might be after Yamashita's treasure. Recent suspicious encounters on the mountain. Have you seen that? I'd like you to meet our inspector. Along with dire warnings from Chuck, has the team spooked. When they think you found a treasure, they, they might step in and either steal it from you or just kill you right then and there. So Bingo wants to know if their safety is truly in jeopardy and how deep the treasure conspiracy goes. To get answers, Bingo's meeting with author and New York Times contributor, Roland Keltz. Hey, Roland. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to finally meet you, sir. Who's uncovered covert operations by the United States government involving Yamashita's treasure. On our mountain, we're getting a lot of attention, and a lot of it could be just paranoia. But I'm really wondering who, historically, would have been interested in this treasure and who may have benefited from it? Who might be after us if we do find something? You know, to really understand the story of this treasure uh, and how deep and how distant it goes, uh, you have to go back to what I would call a, a key point or a pivotal point in, in history which is when the man who oversaw the American occupation of Japan and was arguably the, the most powerful person in Japan at the time, the ruler of Japan, uh, when he learns about this massive treasure uh, hidden in the Philippines. And that man is uh, General Douglas MacArthur. After Japan's official surrender on September 2nd, 1945, Allied occupation of Japan began led by the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers, U.S. General Douglas MacArthur. Well, MacArthur, he was the king of the roost. A five-star general, MacArthur commanded successful military campaigns from World War I through the Korean War. After World War II, MacArthur ordered the Tokyo Trials, a military tribunal to prosecute the leaders of Japan for war crimes with the exception of General Yamashita, who was tried separately and sentenced to death beforehand. And the Tokyo trials were meant to be a rough equivalent of Nuremberg trials in Germany. However, as we know, in Germany, there were several parties at the table. In Japan, largely, it was the Americans. Allegedly, MacArthur led an effort during the trials to extract intelligence from the Japanese defendants in exchange for reduced charges, or in some cases, even complete exoneration. So here you have this sudden opportunity. The Americans are running the Tokyo trials. People were looking for ways to save themselves and their families. Um, so deals were being made, left and right. Many Japanese who would give intelligence, intelligence about military campaigns in Asia, about communist China, about Soviet Russia, and intelligence about a treasure, a massive treasure. That's how someone like MacArthur got access to all this information. According to Roland, MacArthur alerted President Truman to the war loot hidden in the Philippines. 
effectively launching a covert American operation to extract the treasure. You say General MacArthur all the way to President Truman. I mean, those are some really bold claims. Is there any actual evidence to back this up? Well, you know, actually, it's kind of extraordinary how much evidence there is. In the US, Bingo is learning that knowledge of Yamashita's treasure could have reached as far as the Oval Office. I have here um, material that quite explicitly shows that General MacArthur was knowingly involved in capitalizing on this loot that the Japanese had stolen, uh, but also that he knew how it could be used. While researching connections between the US government and Yamashita's treasure, Roland uncovered recently declassified documents drafted by General MacArthur to President Harry Truman. This is a report from MacArthur. Now, these documents were not publicly available at the time. Okay. So declassified what we have is declassified information. And the fact that he has actually found uh, this treasure and has declared that uh, he can keep it. These are MacArthur's words right here. We have legal right to access all of these valuables, precious metals and stones belonging to the Japanese government and valuables belonging to designated individuals. So anyone scheduled by SCAP, Supreme Commander, who is MacArthur himself. Now he's saying so they can legally do that. Exactly. If you're the Supreme Commander of your occupation, you can declare what the law is. What do they do with this information? I mean, they know treasure's out there. They know there's a great amount of wealth there. I mean, why was he even interested in this? World War II may be over, but America is on the verge of the Cold War. The USSR and the United States are building up their nuclear arms, and it certainly costs money to do the intelligence. In order to gather this intelligence research, Truman created the CIA in 1947. Some speculate MacArthur and Truman pursued Yamashita's treasure to build a war chest to finance covert operations against the Soviets. A fund was developed. It's a, it's a fund of many names, actually. Probably the most common are Black Eagle Trust and also the M Fund. It's alleged that for decades, gold recovered from Yamashita's treasure launched the Black Eagle Trust Fund, or M Fund to finance the most daring covert operations during the Cold War. Laundered through 172 banks in 42 countries, this money was all hidden from congressional oversight. Here was a treasure chest you could dip into without regulation, without congressional approval, without even a vote. You can decide what you want to do because you have access to all of this wealth, and it's off the books. Is there any evidence to support how much was in this fund? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, here we have hard numbers, bank records. In addition to secret reports from MacArthur, Roland also uncovered declassified bank statements, connecting key members of the general staff to large amounts of gold. And the amount is 20,000 metric 20, tons. 20,000 metric tons. Of gold bullion. These are photos of Marquardt, who was one of General MacArthur's men and who was the one uh, whose name is on what is known as the M Fund, uh, otherwise known as the Black Eagle Trust. The M in M Fund is not MacArthur. Uh, obviously, MacArthur didn't want his name on it. Uh, but Marquardt, who is one of MacArthur's uh, lackeys. Brigadier General William Marquardt headed up MacArthur's Economic and Science Division during the occupation of Japan after World War II. It's alleged Marquardt used his position as a cover to set up these accounts around the world. MacArthur and his cronies, um, they were willing to do whatever it took to get access, really, to this buried treasure. So it means obtaining maps, obtaining information. Uh, and they would go so far, allegedly, uh, as to resorting to torture. Uh, in one case, torturing General Yamashita's limo driver in order to get information they wanted and needed to find this 
buried treasure. You know, it's interesting you say that because we've been warned in the past. That, uh, I think, again, as we get closer, that concern is just very real. Well, we know what these guys have done in the past. And uh, from this evidence, um, that these vast amount of money uh, attract people who are willing to torture, uh, and maybe worse, in order to get their hands on it or to protect it uh, or to keep it to themselves. So honestly, if I were you, uh, I would be very, very careful. Many believe the Black Eagle Trust Fund is still used to this day to finance covert CIA operations, meaning efforts by the US government to recover Yamashita's treasure may still be going on. It's a dangerous situation. Back in the Philippines, Miners Levi and Geo continue digging around the tunnel collapse. It's going good. It's been back-breaking work, but we've definitely made a lot of progress. I really hope we're getting close to breaking in. So once we get inside of there, I'm excited to see where this tunnel goes. My greater hope for this tunnel is that we can get in here, safely catch it all up, and that it connects to a network of tunnels inside the mountain and potentially have treasure in it. Look at that, Gio. It broke through. Oh, yeah, she's open, man. Nice, dude. I'm going to open this hole up a little bigger. I'll get it to where we can get in there and take a look. And I'll probably crawl through there and see how bad a shape it is. When you go into an old tunnel like this, there's a lot of different stuff you have to worry about. We've already dealt with booby traps, and this is something that we could be dealing with in here. I'm really hoping, now that we're broke through, we can find a clear passage up to the waterfall. Boat float. Yeah. Ugh. Ooh. You seen anything? I see some timbers. Can you tell how far it goes? No, I can't. It looks like it's turning a corner. Hey, man, you got to get out of here. Get oh, back yeah. out. Go. Get out of here. Deep in the tunnel. It looks like it's turning a corner. Hey, man, you got to get out of here. Get oh, back yeah. out. Go. Get out of here. got into high carbon dioxide in there, man. There wasn't hardly any oxygen at all back in there. It's hard to breathe. The carbon dioxide will overtake, overtakes oxygen, you know? I know from different mines I've worked in that you will get these pockets of carbon dioxide. They can be caused by volcanic formations. And what'll happen is that carbon dioxide is one and a half times heavier than oxygen. So what it'll do is when you get into an area that's confined like this, it'll actually overtake the oxygen and it'll hang about knee height. You're gonna take one breath and you're gonna hit the floor and you're dead. After allowing oxygen to cycle into the tunnel, Levi and Geo go back in to check the carbon dioxide level. Keep an eye on that. I'll let you go in front of us. If we start getting a high gas rating, we'll shut down. You can't be complacent when it comes to these gases. If you don't have a gas detector, a lot of these gases that'll get you, like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, all these, they're senseless, colorless, odorless. You won't even know. They build up in your bloodstream. They'll slowly build up to where you're sicker than a dog and you can't work. Worst case scenario, you start getting disoriented, end up going down. They don't even know what happened. Well, we don't want to go no further than this, Levi. We got our oxygen's messed up. It's getting bad. Well, we got low readings, but we don't dare go any further. Well, let's get this whiz bang hooked up. Get this thing ventilating. Yeah, yeah. Let's pull these hoses up here, get it hooked up, and get ventilation in here, and then we'll get back out of here for a couple hours. They're pumping outside oxygen into the tunnel to flush out the remaining carbon dioxide. Every time we 
make a he little bit of headway here, we get pushed back two steps. It's been this way the whole time. Now we got bad gases. Hopefully, we've given enough time to ventilate and get all that gas blown out of there. At the borehole site, the horizontal drill needs to get past the man-made hole the team encountered on their way to the waterfall, still 700 feet away. But with no way to keep water sealed around the drill as it moves through this open space, they're worried it could break down. As we hit that tunnel down there, we lost all the water pressure. In order to breach the tunnel, get the water pressure back, we've got to be able to send a sleeve down in there leave right across the tunnel so the drill bit can hook up back up on the other wall continue going. Installing a metal sleeve across the hole will support the weight of the drill, allowing it to bridge the gap and continue toward the target. What we're looking for here is we want to feel the other side of the tunnel. So it will feel, you'll feel it stop. Um, that's basically what we're for. Yeah, so that's on the other side now. So now we'll slowly, slowly rotate, try and get a bit of a seal, and hopefully we'll get our circulation back, and then we can advance the four inch. And... What happens if we don't make a seal and get water circulation back? If we don't get a seal, yeah, we really can't advance much further out now. If this don't work, we're not going to see nothing. All this has been a waste. This has got to work. It's, it's certainly binding in, so I bet get the jewel pump in there and see if we've got a seal. Give it a shot. All right, mate, fire that water up, see if we've got circulation. All right. All right. All right. Back on track. Here we go. Uh, Let's get down with the drill, huh? Ready to rock now. We were sleeved over the area that was the void space that we hit, and we're back on track to get to the waterfall void. That stretch of mountain that we got to go through, there's a lot between here and there. We really got a significant undertaking here. I hope we get there. With progress stalled at Breach 6, John's revisiting an old site from last year the back door. The last time we were at the back door, we had some issues there. You know, we couldn't really get to the target. I don't see anything in here. It's a bunch of rocks. As much as we tried last year and couldn't get into it, I think it's pretty significant that it lines up to McDougal's map. Now more than ever, I want to get back down there and revisit this thing. I think we walked away too soon. Based on Chuck's map, and confirmation from the drone scout, Max and Colin gather data about the back door, hoping to find a void space that could indicate a tunnel or treasure. We've set up an ERT line, electrical resistivity tomography, over top of the back door void. And what that's gonna give us is if there's a void space under this area, air does not conduct electricity at all. So it's gonna be a big red hot spot right in the middle of the data. So using our ERT seismic and hopefully some ground penetrating radar, we'll be able to image that void and give them a solid target that if they drill right where I tell them to, they're gonna hit, they're gonna hit the void. Later that day. Just to get you oriented, what are you looking to get out of this whole um, data set here? Basically, we're looking to see if this back door or if there's any relation to this back door to get into this tunnel system. Well, we collected a ton of ERT over this site. And of the whole area, this is their whole back door site. If I tilt it up, I can show where the ERT line was collected. And you see this, this large resistor. I, I suppose it could be a void, um, but I don't, I don't know. It's looking like maybe about 6 to 15 feet in height and maybe 15 to 30 feet across. Yeah, that's, you know, that's big enough to like be something. The shortest way and the most definitive way to know that you're going in the right direction is through this spot, right through this resistive block. Yeah, we got to get in there. I mean, I, I got to figure out a way to get in here. Using the tech team's GPS coordinates, Rick and heavy machine operator Steve 
search for the spot to access this new void space. Yeah, it is right, right here, right here. Under our feet is a huge void space, man. I just need to get a work pad cleared in here. We can get these boulders moved out. I need a big, flat workspace area here. Getting all this confirmation about the back door is like finally finding the last piece to the puzzle that's going to get us in this mountain. With the new data that we've got, we know that that void space comes almost to the surface. The big hope is that we found access into this mountain. At the tunnel site, after pumping in fresh air for over five hours, so hopefully we've given enough time to ventilate and get all that gas blown out of there. It's time to get back to work. All clear to here, looking good. Geo's done his checks back there. All the gases look clear, oxygen levels are good. Now we're able to get through this hole, get everything barred down and start exploring. We're gonna get back in there and we're gonna see where this tunnel goes. Boy, that ground looks a little shaky. This ground is really edgy in here, Levi. I'm through the break-in and on the inside of the tunnel. The ground is very sketchy. The rock is super oxidized, and the timber is just virtually rotted to nothing. So we're going to have to be really careful repairing this thing. It's going to be time consuming. Look at all the clay and mud in the ground. And it's all held together by this mush. I think we're going to have to go slow when we go through here and bar it down really good, take our time, and get as far ahead as we can to give us an idea of what we have ahead of us, you know? We just broke through into the old tunnel. I can see in there, it's not totally collapsed. I mean, there is some sort of a void. It's awesome that we hit it. So how far in here do you think we are? I bet we're in here seven to 800 feet now, man. As the miners head deeper into the old tunnel, they probe the walls, looking for any weak rock, which could trigger another cave-in. Hey, Gio. We got another giant wreck. It's getting worse all the time, man. Hopefully, I can get a hole opened up and we can see in there. Hopefully, it's not plugged tight. <laughs> Turn your light off real quick, Gio. There's light coming through here. That's got to be the surface. What is going on? on the next Lost Gold of World War II. Here we go. We're going to send smoke coming out of that opening. Whoa, 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 stop, stop. What's that right there? You see this big diamond shape here? If we can find that, I think we can start to figure out the rest of this map. It doesn't make any sense. It goes from solid rock to sand to solid rock again. Come on, baby, get in there. Push, push it. I can't do it, man. I think maybe I'm just pushing this whole back door thing too hard. There's got to be a better way in here. I don't know. 